Today, we're gonna talk about a memory called Empire. This is one of my favorite reads of 2020 to the point where I read it twice. This was the second time I read it in 2020. And the first time I read it, I didn't feel like I could give it a quality review or at least the review I feel it deserves. And jury's still out on that, but I'm gonna try because I wanna talk about it and I think it's so good and I want it to find its correct audience because it's not for everyone, no books for everyone. I think especially this one. <laughs> and yeah, let's get into it. What is A Memory Called Empire? It is a slow, dense, political intrigue space opera with very lyrical prose and very complicated and layered theming. And I loved it. I was like a four out of five stars. I am so excited for the sequel. And I just love it. This is a story that I wouldn't recommend unless you want to engage with the material. And what I mean by that is I personally had the most fun when I was awake and was able to think about the themes or start like hypothesizing about what could be happening next or trying to figure out some of the symbolic meanings in the poetry that's introduced. And it, the vocabulary is very out there for me. For me personally, I read it on my Kindle and I had to tap quite a few words to figure out what they meant. And yeah, that makes it a challenging read. It means it's probably not for everyone because it's not a pleasure read. This was for me more of a thinky sci-fi read that hit a lot of my boxes for like, like I said, just thinking about things and the thematic elements. I just love it. So if you want to know my surface level thoughts, four out of five stars, it's imperfect. Parts of it is based off some of the pacing issues I felt were in the plot. But boy, if you like a sci-fi that makes you think, but also provides a really great story, I don't think you can find many that are this good. The synopsis of A Memory Called Empire involves Mahet, an ambassador from the LaSalle station to the Texcalan Empire. That is how I will be pronouncing that name. It's probably incorrect, but it's also a made up word, so I don't feel too bad. <laughs> The Texcalan Empire basically annexes in a bunch of planets into its influence, and the LaSalle Station is involved with working with this empire but wants to remain independent. And one day they get a notice saying, we need a new ambassador, please send one post haste. And they're like, okay, but what happened to our other ambassador you have? So that's what Mahet's doing. She is traveling to the empire, which she has always loved. She is, has this strong connection to the literature and culture of Texcalan. She loves a lot of the culture of this empire that she does recognize is, is devouring her own. And so she's going there and she has to figure out, is my predecessor alive? Is he dead? What am I supposed to do to make sure the station stays independent? And that's the start of the political intrigue and mystery. And it goes from there. And what I will say, and now that we'll just get into the review part of the plot, I really liked that every time I had a question, the main character had the same question. <laughs> Mahet and I were just very like, why is this a thing? And I think that's really great storytelling when things don't make sense, but the author and the main character are recognizing that like, this is a gap in knowledge we need to fill and the knowledge gaps are filled and there are some small things that I'm not sure if I completely buy into by the end of the story. But for the most part, I was taken through this whole plot and I felt really fulfilled in all of the intrigue introduced, all the answers to the question, how each action was triggered, like the big changing turning points of the moments in the stories. like. To a large extent, you have to wonder why does this one ambassador have such an important part in this moment in this empire's history? Because it's a very tense moment and why does this empire need this ambassador right away? Like, it's a very tiny, tiny part of the solar system or the galaxy compared to what the empire controls. And how that pans out is really interesting and I thought had some really great payout. What I will say about pacing is that although on average I found it engaging and it had explosive moments, there are lulls in the middle that I felt both times I read it, but by the end I was just blowing through it and I could not put it down. I was just so in the moment with it. But also leading into a potential con, potential pro, depending on the type of reader you are, what you find brings you joy in your literature, the writing style. I think I might have mentioned this at the top, but the writing has a lot of... It has an expansive vocabulary, I'll say. There were many times when I had to click on my Kindle and look up the definitions of words because a word was being used I hadn't seen in a very long time or maybe have never seen. 
the Texcalan culture itself is very based on literature and allusions and poetry and linguistics. So there's a lot of layering there that sometimes takes a minute to unpack. A lot of the theming is talked about in a very introspective way through our main character, Mahet. And so there's just a lot of things that sometimes don't go, I think, naturally with the narrative flow, but lend itself to a very purple, rich, lyrical writing style. And depending on how your brain works with processing that is going to make or break your experience with this book. For me, I felt like for the first time I was reading a book and understanding what people say when they were like, I really loved reading that sentence. That was a good sentence. Now I could be wrong. I have no sense of what that actually is in literature. I don't have a degree in reading or writing. I am actually someone who usually doesn't like writing to be in the way of my narrative experience. But in this case, there were times where I was just highlighting sentences and just sitting in the paragraphs and I was just enjoying reading. Like I couldn't imagine doing this in any other way but physically reading, if that makes sense. I couldn't experience this through a movie or through a TV show. Audiobook maybe, like for me I just prefer physically reading when I'm like dissecting a sentence, but it was a really interesting experience. Now that said, that's not going to be for everyone. That's a lot of work and if you're not connecting with the themes or the characters or you don't care about the intrigue plot or the plot's going too slow for you, then this is going to be more of a hindrance, right? But, for, but if you're someone who likes to have this in their stories and you don't see it as often in some sci-fi, I think you're going to really like it here because it does what I think a lot of classic sci-fi does really well, but with a modern twist and with a very compelling story. Now let's talk about the characters and <laughs> whether you might connect to them. I'm going to talk about just two of them because I feel like this is our main cast. We have Mahet, the ambassador from LaSalle Station. She is very tall. I kind of imagine her as CJ Craig from West Wing if you've ever seen that. I don't know, just like a really tall political figure. And then you have three seagrass. Um, the naming convention in Texcalan is a number noun sort of thing. They talk about it in the book. And both of them, I felt this time around, I really got to see their sass and sarcasm with each other. So three seagrass kind of shows up and is like, I'm your liaison. And, you know, Mahet smartly is like, do I trust you? And three seagrass is just like, well, you might as well. <laughs> and, so they have this really funny banter that I do think would be hit or miss. My first time reading it, I didn't see the banter as much, but the second time I just was loving their quips back and forth. They, they were very clever quips because they're both very clever individuals who are at the top of the Texcalan empire. This is a place where wordplay is important. So I enjoyed their interactions. I enjoyed a lot of the side characters, but I do think this is one where you could see them as not being that vibrant. But for me, at least especially the second read, I had these strong visions of these people and how they were interacting. And this is a very introspective story. I think it's third person limited. Again, don't have a degree in reading. The last time I actually spent time learning that was 15 years ago. <laughs> but you get a lot of the introspective thoughts of Mahet and her experience in this empire that she both loves and will never be actually belong to. And I thought that was really interesting and I really liked her musings. There's a couple other character parts that I don't want to talk about because I don't want to, I don't know, I don't want to spoil things, <laughs> but I think the character work is pretty good, but I think it also depends on how well you're meshing with the wordplay in the writing style. Now let's briefly talk about the world building. I really like the world building. I think the world building was used so well to bring across a lot of themes that were in this story. So we have the LaSalle Station, and we have the Empire. Those are the main things we're looking at. LaSalle Station, you have a lot of very tall people, presumably because gravity doesn't, you know, make you stop growing, maybe. I have no clue actually why they're so tall, but they're tall. That's my hypothesis. <laughs> and they're shorter on in the Empire, presumably because gravity and things like that. And also, although the Empire, like I've alluded to, really appreciates literature references, allusions, basically literary art, they are not emotional people. They, the, the idea of a big smile is very barbaric to them. And that's a word that's used many, many times in this work. So they don't like to be very emotional, but yet use an art form that I associate with lots of emotion and things like that. So I thought that was very compelling. They, these, these two worlds have very different connections with each other and technology and the idea of self, which is a part of the theme, like what is a self? There's um, this question that's always asked is, what is the text definition of you or of we? 
things like that. So in Texaclan culture, there are these cloud hooks that you kind of put over your eye and that's your access to the mainframe, kind of their internet, their social media. And there's a moment when characters don't have access to that and the Texaclanlis in that area are suddenly lonely. They don't have that instant tap into what they're used to as their local global community setting. Versus with the LaSalle Station, they're a much smaller group, much more intimate, only 30,000 people. And the way that they preserve knowledge is through these things called Imagilines, which are really cool. <laughs> they're introduced very early on, but if you don't want to know anything about some things, I guess you could tap out now. But the Imagilines are briefly, when you are alive, you record yourself, your thoughts, your personality into this thing at the back of your head. And then they find someone who has compatible personality based what they said on the endocrine system. And then they can put you together and you kind of not meld into a new person. Like the person having this Imagiline put into them is still themselves to an extent, but they have the knowledge, the experience, the memories of the person with them. So that's how they keep generational knowledge because they're a station in space. They don't have time or the ability to let people keep learning how to be pilots each generation. They need to keep that knowledge so they have this chance to survive in the very abrasive and cruel world that is space. So the pilots have 14 generations of knowledge. And I think that's really interesting. It's one of the coolest things about this world to me. And there's also, I, I hope it comes up in the next book, but there's also talk about other things in the further expanses of space. And that's what I'll leave there and let's get into the themes because I'm pretty sure this is where the book has me. The book has me so hard with these themes. The first theme I want to talk about is preservation of memory. And I kind of led into that with the Imagilines, right? They both have this. Both cultures preserve memory. We have this dynasty of an empire. I mean, what's a dynasty without its legend, without its memory? I mean, the book's name is A Memory Called Empire, which I feel is a very Tex Kalanli <laughs> title for a book, personally. And Three Seagrass even has a line, so much of who we are is what we remember and retell. And this is when, when they were discussing stuff about the Imagilines and things like that, because the, the, uh, the idea of an Imagiline to a Tex Kalanli person is quite horrifying. They, they can't fathom it. It feels like cheating to them. And on the flip side, like we said, with the Imagilines, well, they're preserving memory in a kind of more scientific way, maybe even a more concrete way, because as Mahet will talk about is they preserve memory in the Tex Kalanli empire to an extent of they hold on to things that should be left behind, should be forgotten, should be dead. And they also get warped. Like people will start believing that these stories, these grandiose tales are real. And, you know, that leads to issues. Like if you do everything in such a dramatic way, how, how are you able to do something constructive? And that's a part of the problem we're in in this book. So this preservation of memory is a really big part that I really loved about this story. And the idea of memory also leads into the parts of, well, what is it to be a person? Like, what does that mean to be a person? Like I said earlier, there's always this question of what is the text clan definition of you? Because obviously adding an Imagiline changes things, right? Like me, if you were to ask me, what makes you you? I would say a lot of who I am is based off my past experiences, so my memory. However flawed, like our memories are inherently flawed. We do not remember things exactly, especially at moments of trauma or great stress in our lives. Our brains actually rewrite that history in small, insignificant ways most of the time. So who am I if suddenly my memories are mine plus somebody else's together? And I think that's a discussion that's talked about a lot in this book, and I don't know what the answer is, honestly. Like, there are definitely answers given, but it's really interesting. And one conversation I had about individuality in this book that I thought was interesting was this tie-in to personality and how a personality type is closely tied to who an individual is. And both cultures kind of have this. Um, we meet a character who says, well, personality types exist all over, and I think I think I've been thinking about this my whole life. I'm sure you all have too. You meet people and you're like, oh, you remind me of this person on TV or this person I've met. Like people kind of fit into these loose arbitrary boxes you make in your mind. 
sometimes based off how extroverted or introverted they are, how hardworking they are, what hobbies they like to do, what type of energy they give off. We kind of subconsciously compile all these things and we don't put a person in a box, but we have groups of people that remind us of other people. And in a similar vein, the uh, stationers, they talk about how personality is mostly the endocrine system, which is your, it's basically just your physiology. There, there's a lot of hormones that are going on and off, and that's what they were claiming makes a lot of your personality. And it's through that testing of the endocrine system that they kind of test compatibility for the Imagilines. And I just think that conversation was interesting. I find a lot of the conversations in this story really interesting, including the next one, which is the nature of empire. Oh my goodness, do I like this conversation, especially since the definition of empire can be very different. So this is a very traditional empire, you know, central point keeps annexing in planets. But I feel like it's also more of a cultural empire, which is very similar to what we have in our world, we have this Western culture empire that seeps into every culture. And, you know, it, it's impossible. It's just how capitalism has had it worked out. And I think there's really a lot of parallels between what we notice in our lives versus what's happening here. Like you have Mahet from this other place who loves the stories and the lore told in Texcalan. Like it's, it's very similar to like when I went to Venezuela as a kid, I would watch the TV in Spanish of what was playing in the United States. And so that happens to a lot of kids. You love this other culture's media, but when you then go to that culture, so when my Venezuelan cousin comes to the United States, they might love it. They might've spent all this time learning the language, learning the culture. There is no universe, unfortunately, when in which she is automatically accepted into the culture. She'll never be American by other people's definition. And that's what Mahet has to go through in this story is that she loves this culture. She wants to connect with it. She spent all this time learning it, but there is no amount of work she could put in to not be considered a barbarian, which is a word that is used so much <laughs> in this story, even to the point where I feel like it's a little over the head browbeaten for me because like they honestly even kind of know that she's not a barbarian. They like know that they're playing with it. Like it's a word play that they keep using, even though there are many things the Tex Kalanli culture does that if you're reading it from our standpoint here in our current times, you're like, that's a very, what I guess I would call old style barbaric way of doing things. Like there's blood sacrifice. Like there are lots of things that still exist in this refined civilized empire that claims that they are above everything that we might consider barbaric. So like that definition is very different. Uh, I'm, I'm rambling, but this, this empire and studying it and the conversations that Arcady Martin has through these characters is so interesting. It's this predator. Like it is always described as this predator, even by a character who loves it so much. It just eats and eats and it even eats its own leaders, its own people. Because I think it was a line in this book that I really liked that nothing empire touches remains itself. Things always change with this outside influence. Like I said, even the people within the machinations, like citizens who are born in that empire, if they get high enough up into the empire chain, their work, their meaning, their individuality is no longer their own. And it is, it's a discussion. <laughs> And I think it's really interesting that we are dropped into this story at a moment of civil unrest in this empire because we get to see the different things Arcady Martin says are reasons why this empire is in a state of unrest and potential solutions. I don't know if I agree with the solutions, but I did like thinking about why are we in this position? Why are people leaning this way or that way? It's, it's very relatable based off what we've been currently going through the past four years in the United States, at least. And, oh man, it was, it was really something that I like to think about. This was the point where I really liked engaging with the work because this is not spoon fed to you. You have to think about this part because this is the scenario you're given but you're not given the why. There's no easy why as to why we're in this point. It actually moves quite quickly. And for me, I think the hypothesis I came up with is there's this stagnation that comes at every point in an empire's place that you can only spread so far. You can only be the same for so long. And if you don't adapt, if you don't change, if you don't address the issues that are happening to your people, 
there's going to be civil unrest. That was something I took away from it. I think for a large part, people were done with the status quo and they were unsure about the future. But I don't know, that, that this was something that was never spoon fed to me. This was my own interpretation. And that's what I love about this work. There are so many conversations, so many interpretations. And yeah, I've tied that in with a story and characters I found really fun and the payoff at the end. I forgot how it was going to end and I was still just like, yes, <laughs> I really love this story. So if any of this sounds like it'll work for you, I really think you should give it a go, especially with the sequel coming out. I also think people who like stories like Dune would probably connect well to this one because I feel like Dune is also a very thematic space opera that that one kind of holds your hand a little bit more on its philosophy, but in terms of like a politically intriguing space opera, they both have some overlap there. I do think I like this one a, a little bit more, <laughs> but they're both really great works. And if you made it this far, if you've read it, I would love to talk to you about anything. Just make sure you add spoiler tags for anything of note. And if you haven't read it, do you think you will? Do you have any other questions? And if you just want me to have an emoji to let me know that you are here, leave a spaceship. A spaceship emoji would be wonderful. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.